Matthew 23, verse 25, it says, Jesus speaking, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. The title of the sermon tonight is Full of Extortion. Full of Extortion. So, it's sins that will get you kicked out of church, part six. Sins that will get you kicked out of church, part six. Today we're going to be looking at extortion. The sin of extortion. I'll just read to you quickly 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 and 11. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, he said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with who? Fornicators. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners. That's one mention of the word extortioners. Or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Verse 11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, so not, don't keep company with someone that's a believer, a brother in the Lord, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard. We've gone through all those sins that would get you kicked out of church. Or an extortioner. That's the last one on this list. With such and one know not to eat. Okay, so an extortioner is someone that we're meant to kick them out of the church and we're not to eat with them, we're not to fellowship with that person, okay? Now, when I mentioned to uh, Cameron uh, today, like, he asked me, what am I preaching? I said, sins that will get you kicked out of church, part six. He goes, man, how many are there? How many sins are going to get you kicked out of church? This is the last one in this list, okay? This is the last one in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, but in 2 Corinthians, I believe there are another three that will get you kicked out of church, okay? So at some point, I'll cover that, but it's, it, I'm, I'm probably going to, I'm going I'm to give it a break for a while, and then we're, we're going to cover that later on, because otherwise you're all going to think, man, we're all deserving of getting kicked out of church, okay? But as we see through this list, these are some major sins that you get kicked out of church, primarily because it will influence the church, okay? It's like leaven that will leaven the church. It will cause others to commit the same kind of sins. It will cause the church to be divided and it will cause the church to not be united and not to be of that one mind that we saw in this Corinthian church, okay? Now, when it comes to the topic of extortion, there's only, I think there's eight mentions, yeah. There's eight mentions, only eight mentions in the Bible. It's kind of like when I preached on railing. You know, there wasn't, men, there wasn't much mention of the Bible. I think there's about eight or nine mentions as well. So what we're going to do is go through all eight mentions. We've already gone through three of them, okay? The passage that Matthew read for us in Matthew 23. We're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, we saw that mentioned twice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is another mention. So that's four mentions already in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if, if you don't remember, that was when uh, we were instructed not to take our brethren before the government, before the law, or sue our brethren over trivial matters, if you remember that, when we covered that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, and because if we take him to the, to, the, to the law, if we take him to the government over trivial matters, we're making people that are unrighteous, who are full of sin, to judge that matter, when it should be judged within the church. We're not talking about criminal activities. Okay? God has given us the government, He's given us the law as an institution for the nation to, to, uh, to punish evildoers, okay? to punish criminal acts, but when it comes to just trivial matters that we're in the church, we're not to take that before the law, okay? And that's where it gets mentioned, because if we bring these things before the law, if we bring this before the unjust, if we bring these things before the unrighteous, it says, it gives that list of who these people are. And it says, no thieves, no covetous, that, that was in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 10, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So you don't want to take your, your matters that you have you know, your, your fights and problems that you have within the church, you don't want to take that to the unjust. You, you don't want to take it to people that are extortioners, okay? And if you think, oh man, no, Kevin, you know, out the authority, they're righteous, they're just trying to do their best. No, God says they're full of these sins, they're drunkards, they're extortioners, they're going to try to take advantage of you in every situation. But still, even though the government is full of these people, that is an institution that God has put into place to deal with evildoers, okay? So we can't just ignore the government altogether whatsoever, okay? So I just want to make sure that's understood because extortion is not just a sin, but it is a crime, and we'll cover that later on. Now, if you don't know what extortion means, or an extortioner, I just looked this up in the dictionary. It just means to obtain, that can be money, information, or an act 
from a person by violence, by intimidation, by abuse of authority, or to obtain by force, by torture, by threat, or the like. So if I want to get something out of you, it can be money or anything else, and I threaten you, I do it by force, and you, and you then do it because you, you know, you're afraid for your life or whatever, that's extortion. Okay, that's extortion. It's more than theft. Okay, it's more than theft. It's you willingly giving something up but by force because of fear of your life or fear of, of something else, okay? That's extortion, being forced to do something against your will, okay? Now, we commonly know this as blackmail, okay? We probably, that's a term we're probably more familiar with, okay? Blackmail, okay? Making someone doing, thinking that, you know, there's a threat for them and they go ahead and do it to please somebody else. If you've ever been someone that's been extorted or you've ever been blackmailed, okay, you know that it's not a pleasant place to be. You know that it's extremely wicked and you know you're being forced to do something against your will, okay? Now, I sometimes, I want, I want children, you know what? Children have a way to blackmail one another, especially if you have a family full of siblings, full of brothers and sisters. You know why? Because sometimes one of the ch ch uh, ch children will do something wrong and they don't want mum and dad to know about it, okay? So what does the older sibling do or another sibling do? He goes, oh, if you don't, you know, do this for me, then I'm going to tell mum and dad what you did, you know, that other time. You know, that's kind of funny. We kind of laugh at that kind of stuff. But that is extortion light, <laughs> okay? Kids can learn this at a really young age and parents, we ought to discourage that kind of behavior. And kids, if your brothers or sisters have done something that mum and dad, you know, you, you're threatening them, threatening them that mum and dad will know about it, then you should tell mum and dad anyway. Okay, I mean, if they, ought to, if they need to know about it, they ought to know about it and not use that against your siblings, okay? You need to make sure those things are out in the open because mum and dad need to know about it. It's not, not a secret that you should keep because otherwise you might be tempted to use extortion. You might be tempted to blackmail your siblings to do something against your will. And that is a sin that will get you kicked out of church. So you want to make sure that's out of your system because kids learn this really quickly, okay? And then when you apply it to adulthood, boy, you know, you can cause a lot of problems, okay? Now, let me, let me explain something about extortion that you may not understand. And I, I didn't really fully understand this because some people associate this with bribery, okay, the sin of bribery. Now, bribery is a sin. And let me give you an example of this. Um, you, know, you know in churches that have missionaries, you know, sometimes missionaries have, have like prayer letters every month. And then in one of the churches that I was in, they, they had a prayer letter, prayer letter from, a, from a missionary in Papua New Guinea. A missionary in Papua New Guinea. And, um, you know, in some of these third world countries, in some of the, especially the East Asian, na East Asian nations, the government is corrupt. Okay? I mean, power is out of control. Even in some South American and Central American countries, you know, there is an abuse of power. There's an abuse of authority. And there's a lot of extortion that takes place. But I used to conf confuse bribery with extortion. So in one of the prayer letters for this Papua New Guinea missionary, he had mentioned that he was traveling through, through, you know, through the jungle or whatever it is, and then they were pulled over by a b bunch of armed men, a bunch of militia, you know, at gunpoint, at gunpoint. And they said to them, look, we're going to allow you to pass through, the, you know, to travel through, you know, without harm, as long as you pay us a certain amount of money, okay? And so the missionary said, you know what, we had no choice, we, get, we paid the money, and then we'll let, you know, we were allowed to, to continue on. I, I remember getting mad at the missionary. I'm thinking, hold on, did you just bribe this guy? Did you just pay your way? I mean, shouldn't you have stood up, you know, and say, look, the Lord's going to defend me, I'm not going to partake of something that's, that's, that's wrong and evil, until I understood extortion. No, they weren't paying a bribe, they were being extorted. They were being black, blackmailed. They were fearful of their lives. You know, guns pointed at them. If they don't pay, they wouldn't be allowed to pass through. Okay? That is uh, extortion. It's not blackmail. Also, growing up, I already told you some, some of you guys that I went to a church. It was called Cabramatta Baptist Church uh, when, I was, when I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s. And Cabramatta at the time, especially in the 80s, was known for the gang, uh, the, the gang, the gang violence. The, 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 the drug trade and, and gang, gang violence during that time in the 80s. And one of the things, there was a lot of Vietnamese refugees, okay, come in, come, uh, ref, uh, that, that settled in Cabramatta. 
and the surrounding suburbs. And these, gang, these gangs would go to business owners and ask them for a payment. They would say, hey, you know, pay me X amount of money and I'll make sure your store and, 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 you know, is safe. We'll make sure that you're taken care of here in, in Cabramatta. Okay? Now, these, these owners, these business owners would pay. They would pay. And you'd think, well, that kind of sounds nice, paying someone to look after them. What they meant by looking after is if you don't pay, I'm going to make your life hell. If you don't pay, I'm going to destroy your business. If you don't pay, we're going to hurt you and hurt your family. That's extortion. Okay? That's extortion. So it's, it's putting, uh, uh, making someone do something against their will by force. And this is a sin that will get you kicked out of church. Okay? This is a sin that will get you kicked out of church. Now, please turn to, turn to Psalm 109. Psalm 109, if you've got your Bibles. Psalm 109. Now, Psalm 109 is a psalm which is, they call this an imprecatory prayer. This is an imprecatory psalm, meaning that this is one of the psalms that, it, that are in the, in the book of Psalms that is, is a cursing. You know, this is King David cursing his enemies. King David cursing the wicked, right? And there are so many Christians today that try to do away with these psalms. They say, well, you know, that was for a time period back in the past. Well, that was just for the kings. That's not for us today. You know, please don't be fooled by this. There's nothing wrong with praying for the destruction of your enemies, okay? And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but please turn to Psalm 109, and let's look at verse number 1. Psalm 109, verse number 1. Does your Bible say to the chief musician a Psalm of David? Right, it's a Psalm of David, and who was David? A man after God's own heart, okay? So, you know, David's not this wicked man praying for, praying for a curse, no. He's a man after God's own heart. Okay? So we can't just throw these psalms out of the Bible. Okay? He was a, a godly man. Yes, he made mistakes, but he was a godly man. Look at verse number one. Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise. So here he's praying to God. Verse number two. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They come past me about uh, also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. Okay, so we can see clearly that David here is praying to God about his enemies, about these wicked people that are, that are against him. Okay, now look at verse number eight, just, just out of interest. It's not so much about this sermon, but look at verse number eight. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Does anybody know what verse number eight is about? If you know, put your hand up. Yep. Judas Iscariot, yeah. Psalm 8 is a prophecy of Judas Iscariot, okay? So because he was an apostle, you can read about that in the book of uh, Acts. I, can't, I think it's Acts chapter 2 where it's mentioned. Um, because Judas was an apostle and he committed suicide and they knew that this psalm was about, about Judas. So they, they said, look, we have to select another apostle to take up his office, okay? And they point to this psalm. So this is actually a, a, a psalm about Judas Iscariot, about the wicked man that betrayed Jesus Christ, Okay? But again, you know, King David is applying this to his own enemies, okay, that, that were persecuting him. Now look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. This is what he prays for against the wicked. He says, Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. So extortion is a curse. Okay? And what he's saying is, I want an extortioner to come and take of the wicked. The, the wicked, the enemy, the wicked person that is persecuting me, God, can you send an extortioner to take advantage of them, to make their life a misery, to make their life a hell, you know, and then to take away all the spoil of his labor? I mean, this is a curse that uh, David wanted on his enemies. The point I want to bring to your attention is that an extortioner will take, care, will, will take advantage of both good and evil people. Okay? They're not a respecter of persons in that way, right? They will, put, they will do their crime against both good and against wicked people, okay? And again, look, there's nothing wrong with praying that God will bring vengeance and judgment upon your enemies, okay? Now, you might say to me, hold on, Kevin, shouldn't we be doing good? Doesn't Jesus teach that we should do good to our enemies? Absolutely, we should do good to our enemies. Look at verse number five. Look at verse number five. What does David say? And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. 
So what, how did David treat his enemies? With good, with love, right? But the, how have they rewarded his goodness and his love? With evil and with hatred, okay? So it's, it's what's the right thing to do with our enemies? To do good unto them, right? To bless them. But it's also right for us, because the vengeance is the Lord's, it's right for us to ask the Lord to take you know, control of this situation, to bring a curse upon these people that are making your life hell. Okay? So we need to understand these things. It's not your job. It's not your job to do evil to your, to your enemies. It's your job to do good, but then you should pray that God will take vengeance. You know, and, and God is righteous. God, is, God has a righteous judgment. God will make sure he takes care of business the way he sees fit. So there's nothing wrong with praying for these things. We don't have to throw these verses out of the Bible. Okay? Now please turn to Ezekiel. Again, we're just going through all the Bible verses that teach on extortion. And just, we're just trying to grab what we can learn. Okay, extortion. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel 22 verse 12. Ezekiel 22 verse 12. Extortion will cause you to forget the Lord. Okay? Extortion will cause you to forget the Lord. Ezekiel 22 verse 12. The Bible reads, In thee, and by the way, this is, the context of this is Jerusalem. This is a time when Israel, J Jerusalem was so wicked, so wicked in the sight of the Lord. If you read this chapter, you're going to see a list of sins that the, the, that the Jews were doing against the Lord. I mean, it's just a list of wicked sins. Okay? And look at this in verse 12. In thee have they taken gifts to, be, to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained off thy neighbors. How? How have they gained from their neighbors greedily? By extortion. And has forgiven, and, sorry, and has forgotten me, saith the Lord God. You know, you read, the, read it in your own time. Extortion is amongst the list of some wicked sins, okay? And it is a wicked sin. It is a wicked sin that will get you kicked out of church. But the point I want to draw out of this verse here is that he says, and has forgotten me, saith the Lord God. You know, if, if you're committing extortion, you've forgotten the Lord God. You say, why? Because you're, you're taking greedily from your neighbor. You're taking things that do not belong to you by force. Okay? And who's supposed to provide all your needs? It's God. Right? You're supposed to rely on the Lord. You're supposed to trust in the Lord that He will provide your needs and He'll provide more than your needs. He'll provide your wants. I promise you that. You know, if, if we keep His commands, we set His kingdom first, He'll take care of our needs. But if you're doing it with your own strength, you're doing it by force, you're doing it against your neighbors, then you've now forgotten the Lord because you're trying to provide for yourself. And greedily, you're taking more than what is correct, you know, that should be upon you. Okay? So this is, this is a major sin. It'll cause you to forget the Lord. And of course, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all... That is what an extortioner wants, right? They want either money, they want possessions, or they want to force you to do an act against your will. Okay? So, I mean, this, this is definitely a wicked sin. Please turn to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, the, the, the chapter that we read from. Matthew 23, verse 25. Matthew 23, verse 25. Now, extortioners, even though they're wicked, guess what? They have an appearance of good. Okay? They're going to look good on the outside. Okay? Matthew 23, verse 25. What does Jesus say to the Pharisees? Okay? Who are the Pharisees? They were the religious leaders. They knew the law of God. They so-called preached the word of God. Okay? Now, some of them were good because some of them believed. You know, Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. Paul, he was a Pharisee. We read in the book of Acts that the number of Pharisees believed on Jesus Christ. You know, some of them were genuine, right? But as a general rule, these Pharisees were wicked, okay? Look at verse 25. Jesus says to them, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of what? Full of extortion and excess. So what were they doing to the people? They were extorting from the people. They were blackmailing people. They were getting what they wanted out of them, right? And again, these Pharisees, they, they, were, they were clean on the outside. They looked like wonderful people, right? These are the people you need to be careful of. 
the religious leaders that are so prim and proper, <laughs> right? You, you start, you start you know, being aware of these people because within, they may very well be full of, full of extortion, full of excess. You know why re- religious, religious, bleh, religious leaders are like this, or, or many of them? Because a lot of people trust a religious leader. A lot of people trust their pastor. A lot of people trust their priest and whatever else, monks and whatever else they think, because they think, man, this person's a good religious man trying to do the best. But you know, this, it's, it's this field that attracts the extortioners because they know they can take advantage of people, right? Even in this church, I've had a few people come to me, you know, with private matters about things you know, they want some advice on, you know? And look, I don't, I don't need to know all your dirty laundry. Honestly, I don't need to know all your sins, okay? I can give you advice without ha- having to hear all your dirty laundry, okay? I don't want to know it. Because I don't want to ever get to a point where I might use that against you. Now, I don't intend to, right? I don't intend to. But you can see that these people did that, right? So, you know, what about, think of the Catholic Church. How people come and confess their sins to a priest. You know, their the, the most private sins, you know, the most wicked sins. They come to the priest and confess those things. Who's got the power over you now? The priest. Yeah, yeah they'll say they forgive you. But hey, they can use that against you now. They've got some information, they've got some dirt on you that they can use against you. And I promise you the Catholic Church are doing that all the time. Okay? They are the modern day Pharisees. They look clean on the outside, full of dead man's bones. We'll see this soon. Look at verse 26. Verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So look, if you're an extortioner, if you've, done, if you've blackmailed people in the past, what are you meant to do? Clean the inside. Clean the inside, then the outside. Verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye, are outwardly, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy, and iniquity okay now what is one of the qualifications of being a pastor a bishop or a deacon you know uh, being not not being greedy or filthy lucre why do you think that's important why do you think that's important not to be greedy of money okay not to not to have the love of money as, as a bishop you know why because again you know as, as, a, as a religious leader you people are going to trust you they're going to come with their with their sins or whatever they've done in the past and if you're greedy for money, you're going to take advantage of that person. You're going to say, hey, pay me X amount of dollars and I'll make sure this information never gets out there. Okay? Pay me X amount of dollars and I won't report you to the police for pedophilia or some crime or something like that. Okay? They care more about money. They care more about extorting people and taking advantage of people than doing what's right. Okay? So please, you know, beware. You, know, you, may never, you may not always be in this church. You might find yourself in another church. Be careful, because extortioners love to become the religious leader, okay? And I'm not saying I'm one of them, right? I'm, I'm never one of them, okay? Uh, but look, you know, if you ever come to me with your sins, guess what? I'm probably going to tell you, look, I don't need to know about it. Just, you know, give me a bit of information and, you know, the situation, and, I'll, and I can direct you from the Bible. I don't need to know your whole list, laundry of, of your sins. And, uh, yeah, just, just be aware of people that want to hear all your dirty laundry, okay? Because most likely they're going to take advantage of you. Now, look, turn to Luke 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verse 11. Luke 18, verse 11. Luke chapter 18, verse 11. This is the, the parable. Or not, actually, I don't think it's a parable. I think it's a real story of a Pharisee and a publican. A publican was a tax collector, okay, that went into the temple and prayed to God. Remember that story that Jesus gave of the two? And the reason I bring this up now is because we are talking about Pharisees. And look how the Pharisee prays. Okay? So they're trying to come and, and, and make themselves righteous before God, make themselves right before God. In verse 11, this is how the Pharisee prays. It says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within, with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. I'm not like the other men. Extortioners unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So what's the Pharisee saying? Jesus, you know, said in his other lesson that these Pharisees are full of extortion, right? 
And what's this Pharisee saying as he prays? I'm glad that I'm not an extortioner like this publican or, or, or like other people, okay? Now, what I take out of that, what I take out of that is that the extortioner does not see themselves as wicked, right? They're full of extortion, but they see the extortion of other people. They don't see that within themselves. They blind themselves of these things, okay? They're not aware of their own wickedness, okay? And they see others as wicked, okay? Now, you know what's another, what's another field that extortioners like to get, get into as far as a, 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 like a job? Sales. <laughs> a lot of sales. Now, I'm not saying sales is a bad job to get into, okay? If, if, if you love sales, if you love selling a product, hey, it's fine, okay? It's, it's fine, okay? Every business needs to sell something to make a living, right? But extortioners love to be salespeople. They love to find ways to take advantage and force people to buy a product that they don't even want. Okay, marketing and sales, they love to extort people. Okay, now what a, what a sales book that I've seen, uh, uh, you, Callum, are you in sales? Used to be, okay. Maybe you've heard this book. Now, there's certain books that make their rounds over a few years and then all, like, all the sales people, oh yeah, this is the new thing we need to, to, to learn. But one book that I saw, it was titled Sell or Be Sold. Sell or Be Sold. Meaning, you better sell something to people. Now, this, is, this isn't just sales. This can be your life. You know, you want to sell something to people so you can get an advantage of them. Otherwise, you'll be sold. Otherwise, they'll sell to you and you'll be taken advantage of. That's the mindset of an extortioner. I have to take advantage of someone. I have to extort from them before they do it to me. Right? Like, that's how they see it. I've got to hurt someone. I've got to do something to them before they do it to me because I'm just protecting myself. And they have this mindset that everyone else is wicked except for them. Okay? But they're trying to do the same thing that they're, they're thinking the other person is trying to do to them. Okay? That's the mindset of an extortioner. This Pharisee full of extortion sees others as the extortioner. Okay? I've got to take advantage before they take advantage of me. So, again, just be careful of that. It, it, maybe, maybe you've been tricked into buying things that you never wanted by force or by manipulation. That's extortion. Okay? Now, please turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Okay? Now, I mentioned that story of the missionary in Papua New Guinea, and he was extorted for money, okay, for threat of his life. Now, let me say this to you. I've, I've given this some thought. If, if I had a threat for my life, someone threatened me for my life or the life of my family, let's say, you know, an example, and I hope this never happens, but let's say someone gets kidnapped, one of my kids, and then there's like, you know, they demand a ransom money, you know? You know what? For the life of my family, I'm prepared to hand over whatever money they want. I'm pre prepared to hand whatever possessions they want. I now recognize that's not bribery, that's extortion. I'm not committing the sin, they're the ones that are sinning against me. Okay? There are some things that, you know what, I'll hand over for my life or for my family's life, because okay? it's just material possessions, it's just money or whatever. But there's one area that I would not compromise on. Okay? What I'm going to be talking about right now is the extortion of worship. The extortion of worship. That there's a time where, you know what, it's worth dying for. There's a time that it's worth giving up your family's life for. Okay? Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. If you guys know this story, Nebuchadnezzar, this is in Babylon. The Jews are now taken captive by, by uh, Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Nebuch uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So the king sets up this golden image of himself. Verse number two. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king sent together together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herod cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, uh, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image 
that Nebuchadnezzar the king have set up. So when you hear this music being played, you're meant to come and worship, bow down and worship this image. Okay? Look at verse number 6. And whoso faileth, sorry, whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So if you don't bow down and worship this image, you're going to be put to death by fire in a fiery furnace. Okay? Is that extortion? Absolutely. It's not extortion for money or for material possession, but it's extortion of worship. Okay? They're trying to cause people, forcing people to worship a false god, to worship an image. And who are we all to worship? Only the God of the Bible, right? Only the God of the Bible. This is something worth dying for. This is worth where you're going to stand up and say, you know what? No, I'm not going to worship a false god. I serve a jealous god. He saved me from my sins. And you know what? If you put me to death, guess where I'm going to be? In heaven, praising God forever, okay? Praise God will be with him forever. Drop down to verse 14. Drop down to verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto... Oh, sorry, I didn't, I'll give you a bit more context. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three godly Jews, they stood up against this and they did not worship the idol, okay? They stood up against this and verse number 14, they get brought before the king. They get brought before King Nebuchadnezzar and he says, to this, he says this to them, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbat, satri, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, if you do that, well, it's good. But if ye worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Okay? So he said, look, last chance. You serve, you worship this idol, or you're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. I love how they respond to this. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. So he says, look, we're not, we're, going to, we're not going to sugarcoat our response to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. We're not careful. We're not going to be careful with our words. If this offends you, it offends you, King Nebuchadnezzar. We're not going to be careful. We're not going to sugarcoat what we have to say. Verse 17. We're going to be blunt and honest. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. And that's the attitude we ought to have. That's the belief we ought to have. If you're threatened for your life to worship a false god, you ought to have the attitude, hey, you know what? God can deliver me out of your hand. You know, I'm going to keep worshipping the Lord God. But look at verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So even if God doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to worship your image. You know, we're going to die. You know, We'd rather die than worship your image. We're willing to give up our lives, okay? Look at verse 19. Then when Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his visage was, cha was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, therefore he spoke and commanded they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So that's the end of them, right? They, they're cast into the fire. If you guys know the story, you know that's not the end of them. Verse 21. Then these men were bound... Sorry. Then these men were bound in their coats... I already read that. Verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot... The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the men that took them into the fire, they got burnt up by the flame. That's how hot it was. Okay, that's how hot it was. The men that threw them into the fire were burnt up. You know, they probably worshipped the image. So they get double whammy. They worship a false god and, and, they're, and they're burnt up in the fire. Uh, and then uh, verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, 
He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the four, fourth is like the Son of God. The Son of God was, was with them. Who's the Son of God? Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus Christ was with them in the fire. He didn't stop them from being put in the fire, but he protected them in the fire. Okay? Now, this is a real... Look, God may came, come through and save your life. Okay? Otherwise, you know what? If, it's, if it need be, you die for the cause of Christ, you stand up for his name, you know, you might have to give up your life. But you know what? If you give up your life, you know what the Bible promises you? The crown of life. Okay? God promises you the crown of life if you die for his name. Now, the crown of life, I'm telling you now, will be worth 100-fold your own personal life, okay? So, but anyway, in this case, we see that Jesus Christ himself stepped in and saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And by the way, he was the son of God before the New Testament. He was the son of God before he was born. Okay, I'm starting to hear this, this nonsense, this heresy, where he became the son of God in Bethlehem's manger. That's not true. Jesus Christ has always been the Son of God, okay? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, okay? He's always been the Son of God. We see him the Son of God in the Old Testament even before he came and was born in Bethlehem's manger. We won't go into that right now. Verse 26, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. So their lives were saved, okay? They decided to worship God and not worship the idol. That is the right time not to give in to extortion, okay? That is the right time to make sure, hey, I, I, I've got to be willing to give up my life. And I've got, you know, I'll ask you guys today, are you willing to give up your life for Christ? I mean, just honestly, you don't have to answer that, just, just within yourself, okay? Again, I'm not willing to give up my life over money or possessions or my house. I don't care. You know, God can give that back to me if I lose it. But you know what? I will never deny my Savior. Okay? He's done so much for me. And that's the way we ought to be. Like Shadrach, Mishra, and Abednego, these ought to be our heroes of the faith and, and willing to give up our lives for his name's sake. Okay? Now, this is a sin that will get you kicked out of church, extortion. Please turn to Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19. Let me say this to you as a recommendation, right? If you've committed extortion in the past, if you're an extortioner, you've done this in the past, and you've not dealt with it, then let me encourage you to deal with it as soon as possible. Okay? You might say, well, it happened 10 years ago. It happened 20 years ago. It's all done away with now. You know? I got away with it. You know what? Deal with it immediately. Deal with it now. Okay? Now, when it comes to this church, you know, I, I've said to you guys, I don't care about your sins in the past. I don't care about the things that, you know how people were offended in the past or whatever. This church, when this started, it was a clean slate for everybody. Okay, clean slate for everybody, okay? But extortion is the kind of sin that will rear up its ugly, its ugly head sometime again in the future. Okay, if you don't deal with it, it might come up again in the future, okay? Now, you may have committed extortion in the past. I'm not going to hold that against you, but it might come up again in the future, okay? Because you've offended somebody. You've done wrong to someone they might then come and chase after you and, and want to deal with it, okay? And if, it's, if, if you've done it in the past and it comes up now in the present, then I may have to deal with it as church discipline, okay? So I encourage you to deal with it ASAP, okay? Now, look at Luke 19, verse 1. Luke 19, verse 1. Luke 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So he was a tax collector. He was the chief. He was like, the, the, like the, the main tax collector of the area, okay? And he was rich. Verse 3. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little, little of stature. So he, he couldn't. There were so many people that wanted to see Jesus. He couldn't see Jesus because he was short. He's like me. He's shorter than, than, than most other people. Verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore, sycamore tree to see him. For he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I, I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. So Zacchaeus joyfully receives Jesus Christ into his house. 
And I believe this is the picture of his salvation. I believe this is a picture now that he has received not just Jesus Christ into his house, but into his heart. You know, he's placed his faith and trust on Jesus Christ alone. Because what does, you know, John chapter 1 verse 12 say? But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So receiving Christ is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe this is the moment that Zacchaeus was saved. Okay? So he received Jesus Christ into his house. But look at verse number 7. And when they saw it, so when others saw that Jesus went into the house of Zacchaeus, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Okay? That he was gone to be a guest with a man that was a sinner. So they were saying, how can Jesus go into the house of a sinner? Okay? Now let me tell you, when we go knock doors and we preach the gospel, we're preaching to the sinner. Okay? Because Jesus Christ will come to sup with that person. He will come. If they believe on Christ and receive Christ, he will save that sinner. Okay? Now these people murmured. And you know what? You know what I've seen? When we go and preach the gospel and they, people believe on Jesus Christ and we rejoice in their salvation, you know there are other Christians that mock that? They laugh at that. They think it's impossible for someone to be saved at the door after a 15, 20 minute presentation of the gospel. They mock it, they laugh, and they think, well, hold on, this person's still a sinner. They've got to clean up their lives before they prove themselves of anything. That's a lot of churches are like that, right? Oh, they're still a sinner, they must not be saved. You know what? No. Jesus Christ came for the sinner, okay? When we preach the gospel, we preach that it's, it's just by receiving Christ through faith. They don't have to do anything more because Christ will forgive them of their sins. Okay? But hey, when they spend time with Christ and Zacchaeus in this story, he receives Christ into his house and he spends time with him. Okay? If they spend time with Christ, they spend time in the Word, they come to church and they learn, guess what? They will clean up their life. Okay? Eventually the Word of God will have a, power, have, the, you know, have a powerful impact on them and they will change their life. Okay? But have a look at this in verse number 8. So after Christ has come to be a guest in his house, verse number 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And, I have, and if I have taken anything from any man by what? By false accusation. I restore him fourfold. So Zacchaeus knew full well he had extorted from other people. He had made false accusations against people to take more money than what, he, what was rightfully to take by tax. You see that? He falsely accused them, you know, and he had, he had the law on his side. You know, if they don't pay up their tax, they're going to be arrested or whatever. You know, their lives are going to be destroyed. Zacchaeus was an, extortion, was an extortioner. Okay, he had done this to his own people, but he finally recognizes this. Once he's received Christ, once he's heard Christ preach, he says, you know what, I've got to make this right. You know, and that's what I'm saying to you. If you've, extort, if you've done, made extortion to other people, you need to make that right. Okay? And how did he make it right? He restored fourfold. Okay? Anyone that he, that he took from by force or by false accusation, he said, I'm going to restore that times four. Four times as much as I took. And that teaching comes from Exodus 22 verse 1. I'll just read that to you quickly. Exodus 22 verse 1 says, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Now, I don't know why it's five oxen for an ox. I assume because an ox was often used for work in the field. So if you didn't have the ox to work your field, maybe, you know, you, you haven't um, uh, prospered in the same way. So there was a greater, you know, uh, um, retribution given than a sheep because a sheep doesn't really work the field. It just eats the grass. So maybe that's why. But, yeah, you know, uh, Zacchaeus knew this teaching in the Old Testament. And he says, you know, what I've taken falsely from... I'm going to restore that fourfold, okay? Now, let me say this to you. If anyone, you know, blackmails someone else in this church, let's say you take $1,000 from them, and if you want to make things right, you've got to pay back $4,000, okay? Otherwise, I mean, you're going to get kicked out of the church until that stuff gets settled, okay? This is a serious sin, okay? Now, if you're still in, are you still there with Zac in the story of Zacchaeus? I'll just read verse number 9 and 10. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. OK? 
Okay? So he's come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, you know Jesus Christ, very compassionate, even toward some wicked sinners. Okay? Now, please turn to Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 16. Isaiah 16. You know, extortion is not just a sin, it is a criminal offence. Okay? It is a criminal offence, not only in the Bible, but it's a criminal offence in our nation. Okay? Isaiah 16, verse 4. I don't, I don't want to go through all the, um, the context of this right now. Um, but let's look at verse number 4. Isaiah 16, verse 4. Let mine outcasts dwell with thee, Moab, be thou a, con a, a covert, covert, cup, sir. be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at an end, the spoiler ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. So there's going to come a time when the extortion that was taking place here in, in, in Israel was going to come to an end. When was it going to come to an end? Look at verse number 5. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. So this is the last mention that I wanted to bring up to you about extortion. We've gone through all the eight mentions, okay? So here we see that it was a crime in the nation of Israel. And it was, the crime was going to stop when, if you get the context of this, it's when King Hezekiah would rule and reign in Judah. Because King Hezekiah was a godly king. He uplifted the laws of God in the nation. And he says that's when it's going to end. When there's righteous government. When there's a righteous king, king on the throne of David. Okay? And I just say, you can, you can apply this to the millennial kingdom as well if you want, of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because when Christ comes, he's going to rule with a rod of iron, isn't he? Okay? He's going to make sure these kind of crimes are dealt with immediately. And so I just, the only thing that I wanted to take out of that, guys is that extortion is a criminal offence. Not just in the Bible, but in our nation. Okay? So if someone in this church is an extortioner, and I hear about it, and I have to kick you out of the church about it, guess what I also am going to do? I'm going to report that information to the authorities. Okay? Because it's not just theft. I mean, theft should be reported to the authorities anyway. But this is done by force. Okay, this is a criminal offence in the Bible, a criminal offence in our nation. I'm not going to hide that sin in the church. Okay, so please, you know, we might say, well, you know, there's not much mention of extortion. Hey, it's a serious sin. And that's why I encourage you, if you've done this in the past, you've blackmailed, you've taken advantage of someone, go and restore it. Be like Zacchaeus. Go back and restore fourfold. Make sure that it's dealt with so it doesn't rise its ugly head in the future and then, then we have to deal with that in the church, okay?